the unique ability of bringing the voice of agriculture into the Australian government team that is responsible for negotiations. And that's an important role to have because, as everybody knows, agriculture is really central, not only in terms of its mitigation and adaptation potential for uh, climate change, but also because it's one of the sectors that's most influenced by climate change. And I think Australia is probably one of the starkest examples of uh, an industry being affected by climate change. So as I said, we'll have two panels and we'll have uh, time for questions to those two panels and then I'll close at the end. So first, I'd like to warmly welcome Sue McCluskey to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I've been on a number of panels, and as I think everyone knows, once you get halfway through uh, the week, you're, you're pretty well exhausted. <laughs> um, so hopefully we're going to be able to uh, have a wonderful discussion tonight with, with both our panels. So I'm just going to make a number of opening comments um, based on what we're doing in Australia around livestock. Uh, but first I'll start with the fact that, you know, our global food system faces multiple challenges. And, you know, we've got the four Cs. We've got COVID, of course, that we had. We had conflict, uh, the cost of living, um, and climate change, which, of course, is why we're all here today. And that's all in contributed to increase in world hunger. And for the people who are not hungry around the world, they have a malnutrition problem. So we see billions of people that actually lack good nutrition. We see many million children that are actually stunted. And at the same time, our food system is pushing the boundaries. And agriculture accounts for about 70% of total water consumption, nearly 35% of land area, and between 17 and 30% of greenhouse gas, gas emissions. The livestock sector alone contributes up to 15% of GHG emissions, but livestock does play a critical role in food systems that are facing these emerging global challenges. Livestock is key for many smallholders, particularly those in developing countries, as it's an important source of income and a productive asset. Livestock also contributes to nutrition, and animal source foods are important, especially to reduce child stunting in developing countries. So for the global livestock sector to sustainably contribute to food security and nutrition, there will be important changes that will need to be made. For developed countries, they will need to focus on mitigating GHG emissions, and improvements can be made in animal and feed efficiency through better feed and feeding practices and manure management to ensure recovery and recycling of nutrients and energy. On the other hand, the livestock sector in developing countries will really need to focus on improving nutrition and animal health, and also looking at mitigating risk in food safety and zoonotic diseases from livestock. They'll also need much more support for both climate adaptation and mitigation through partnerships for climate smart adaptation. And this is something that in Australia that we actually do do through our International Centre for Agricultural Research, where we partner with governments in developing countries and with the private sector to focus on research and development that could actually really make a difference on the ground for smallholder farmers. And we're doing a lot of work around climate smart um, projects, particularly where we see rising sea levels. So we know there's a significant need to increase the productivity of livestock production uh, and to help lift people out of economic and food poverty. But around 15%, of course, as I said, of the world's entire greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock production. And in Australia, that contribution is also quite a similar amount. And it comes from the ruminant livestock. Now, just a sidebar here. Um, and I can say this, and I've had a conversation with Donald about this uh, when we've, we've come across each other a number of times. Australia is a country that isn't just livestock or agriculture uh, as a majority of industry. We're a country that actually has many industries. So I do need to note that energy production is the largest contributor to Australia's carbon emissions, followed by transport, agriculture and industrial processes. Uh, and this is matched globally. Uh, with fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas being far the largest contributor. So um, I think it's really important, and I was pleased to see that Australia is actually talking about energy, so we're not just focusing on agriculture as being the cause and not part of the solution. We are part of the solution, but we're not the only part of it. 
So there are a number of strategies that Australian livestock has been putting into place. First, firstly, the red meat sector aims to be carbon neutral by 2030, uh, which means no net release of GHGs. Now, I'm not going to go into the technical side of this because I'm sure there are others on the panel uh, that will be doing this, but basically through um, mechanisms such as improved technologies um, and practices, improved genetics, livestock feeds and grazing, according to the researchers, if we maintain stable livestock numbers, the amount of methane produced will actually balance out the amount of methane that breaks down from the atmosphere. So that, that is where we aim to be carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, we certainly are doing a lot in terms of use of technologies. We'll be able to feed people even with a further global temperature rise. And we've also got our beef sustainability framework, which is an overarching framework that really looks at sustainable practices, grazing management, uh, water management, soil management, stock rotation, capture of biogas and recycling of water. And they're all processes that go towards making a much more sustainable beef sector. The Australian Government has also uh, funded a, a methane emissions reduction in livestock program to support R&D in methane reducing livestock feed technologies. Now this is something that's been really exciting in Australia, which has been using um, seaweed to actually be able to uh, put feed additives in and we've got up to 92% reduction in methane emissions. Uh, has been working really well in feedlot situations and dairy situations. And now we're looking at how we can invest, because most of the livestock in Australia, of course, is large grazing, uh, how we can actually get the same sort of additives uh, in methane reduction for grazing operations. So things such as the use of boluses, but also um, additives into the water. And that will be particularly useful for our northern cattle industry, where they might only handle their livestock once a year. That research has been actually now to the commercial stage, so we're seeing asparagopsis, uh, the seaweed additive being used in other parts of the world, and it really is going to be a significant game changer, I think, in terms of uh, methane emissions and the way that we can manage that um, on farm. In fact, they say if just 10% of the global ruminant producers were to adopt this as an ingredient to feed their livestock, it would have the same impact for our climate as removing 100 million cars from the world's roads. And potentially increases in livestock productivity could create enough food to feed an additional 23 million people. So really a game changer indeed in terms of where the research has gone. And just a final word, I think, that uh, has been very interesting for me, uh, given I am a livestock producer, um, and just how I've seen the changing narrative over this year. Uh, the first conference I attended this year was in Santiago, and it was around, you know, the, the stock tag, and I was talking about circular food systems, and a fellow panellist put to me that the way to solve the world's climate change problems was to stop eating red meat. Um, now, you don't say that to a beef cattle producer, but I really had to think about what my response would be. And I really thought about the work that Australia's been doing in developing countries. Um, and as a, a commissioner for our International Agricultural Commission, I've had the opportunity to see what we're doing there in you know, countries such as Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, some of the islands in the Pacific. And I said, really, it's got to be about choice access and equity. And that is really important because everyone does not have the choice. Interestingly, at the most recent FAO conference I was at on food systems, there was a really great discussion about alternative proteins that for me was much more nuanced and much more sophisticated. It actually talked about alternative proteins being in three buckets. The first one was the plant base, the legumes, the nuts that have been around for centuries. The second was basically what we call plant-based meats or fake meats. And the third was cell-based proteins. And the discussion really was about getting a better level playing field around the nutritional components, the safety components and the environmental footprint of these three different groups and then be able to compare them with red meat. And I think, for me, that was great to see. The FAO has said they're now going to do a report on this. But it means 
that we still go back to that choice, access and equity, and importantly, affordability. There's a place for all of these, but we need to be transparent about the information and allow a fair comparison. Thank you, I'll leave it there, and I look really forward to the panel discussion. Thanks. Now, I'd, I should have introduced myself at the beginning. And so just in case you don't know who I am, I'm Rory Peter. I'm the executive director of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And I was really pleased to hear Sue mention the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework because they are the Australian representative organization, if you like, of GRSB. So now, without any further ado, Donald, I'd like to ask you to come up and bring your panel with you. And we'll hear from Donald, who's the executive director of the uh, da Global Dairy Platform and his august panel of uh, dairy and beef representatives. Uh, so you want me to call them all by name? Okay, I'll do that then. Uh, Jay Waldvogel is here as well. Jay? Okay, Jay, thanks for coming. Uh, and I will, am I doing all of the introductions, Donald? Yeah, okay, you'll do the introductions. I'll get through the names quickly then. Andy McFarlane, Madeline Hall, uh, Mitchell Zarati, and Julia Waite from Meat and Livestock Australia. Thanks a lot, guys. Fantastic. So can you all hear me? Excellent. And there's quite a crowd here tonight, so thank you all for hanging around. At, um, it's been a long day. In fact, it's been a long... I was going to say it's been a long week, but of course this is only day one of week two, and it feels like it's been a long week already. Um, but firstly, I'm, I'm Donald Moore, as, as introduced by Rory. I'm the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform, and I have an incredible panel with me on the stage tonight to firstly um, answer a couple of questions I'm going to put to them, but then you need to start thinking now about what questions you want to ask these panellists as you are given an opportunity to do so. So I understand, Rory, we've got three and a half hours for this panel, was that right? Five minutes each, Donald. Um, okay, I don't know what he meant by that, but I think it's three and a half hours. So, so I'm going to start by just quickly introducing my panel a little more, and then I do have some opening questions for each of them. I'm not sure what that was. And then um, we'll give you an opportunity to ask them questions as well. So starting here on my, on my right is Jay Waldvogel. Jay is a dairy industry lifer. I'm going to beat you to announcing that yourself, Jay. Um, he is currently the head of international, strate international and strategy for Dairy Farmers of America. So welcome, Jay. Um, next to Jay is Andy McFarlane. Andy is, in my mind, the crossover kind of like pinch hitter on this panel because Andy is both a dairy and a beef farmer. He is a member of the board of directors of Fonterra Cooperative Group, which is one of the world's biggest dairy co-ops, but he's also on the board of Ansco, the meat uh, company in New Zealand. So welcome, Andy. Um, next to Andy, we have Madeline Hall, a senior environmental policy analyst at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. We've only met by Zoom so far, so it's Nice to meet you in person, finally, Madeline. Um, next to her is Mitch Zarati, and Mitch is the Environmental and Climate Change Coordinator of the Canadian Cattlemen's Beef Association. And Mitch, we've managed to meet each other in many different parts of the world, but never in Canada. So we'll have to sort that out at some point. And last, but by no means least, is Julia. And Julia is, um, Julia Waite, sorry. And Julia is the CN30 project manager for Meat and Livestock Australia. Now, CN30, I'm going to take a wild guess at this based on what Sue McCluskey has said to us. And I'm figuring CN30 must be carbon neutral by 2030. Is that great? Deciphered, look, yes. Look, we, had the, we had the absolute privilege of speaking together on a panel earlier today and Julia was given like the last spot on that panel. And as you've probably noticed in most of these events, you know, we run a little late. And so by the end of it, the last panelists are getting like, you know, my friend Tanawat Tiensen there is, is going, well, you've got two minutes for your five minute intervention. So Julia, I'm gonna start with you oh. on this occasion because I feel so sorry you were, you were squished at the end of our last panel. And so Julia, 
Can you tell us a little bit about the work that's going on with Meat and Livestock Australia, in particular, what the specific emission redu reduction targets that you have, in, um, have within your own organisation, how you establish them, and what sort of strategies and actions you're implementing to both record and report on those um, and on that objective. So I, I guess we know a little bit about what those targets might be based on what Sue said, but I'm really curious as to what you're doing in Meat and Livestock Australia. Well, I was counting on that um, reflection time, Don, as all the other panellists uh, move down the line, but I guess I'll, I'll kick things off. So yes, Sue gave a really fantastic overview of the Australian red meat sector's uh, net zero target to achieve um, no net release of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 for the beef, lamb and goat sector. Um, the, the target came about somewhat haphazardly, uh, but the industry has really gotten behind it. And it's given um, you know, the private sector in Australia a lot of permission to come in and co-invest with us uh, on some really important R&D to try and um, unlock some new solutions for our industry. So MLA's role uh, is as a service provider to the red meat sector. Uh, we are levy funded by producers, but the large amount of our $140 million portfolio in CN30 technologies is a co-investment that we've attracted from external partners to really unlock um, the emissions reduction solutions that Sue mentioned, the bolus uh, additive trials, as well as some other really interesting things um, with genetics and early life programming, whether we can modify the rumen microbiome at an early life stage of a, a, a calf or a lamb and see that benefit uh, translate throughout the lifetime of that animal as a, as a lower methane producing uh, animal. But to your, your question around, um, oh, I've sort of forgotten your question, Don, now, but um, around what are we doing specifically? Um, a really heavy focus on methane additives and delivery mechanisms. 95% uh, of Australia's uh, livestock are raised in the grazing sector. We've also uh, are custodians of almost 50% of Australia's land mass. Uh, and so that's an incredible opportunity to sequester carbon uh, in our soils and vegetation. So since we set the target for net zero, uh, we've actually um, seen amazing progress. And people are quite surprised to hear uh, the progress to date because they think, well, what's Australia got that everyone else doesn't? Um, we've achieved a 64% reduction in net emissions since 2005 for the red meat sector. And that is largely because of that land under management, that huge opportunity there, and that vegetation regrowth that we've had on red meat, um, red meat land. Um, but we, we recognise that that falls short of achieving long-term climate mitigation. Uh, and won't meet the expectations of the supply chain long term. So that's why we're really invested uh, heavily in emissions avoidance technologies and um, working on uh, improving efficiency on farm. That's something we can do today while we wait for some of these solutions to become commercial. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And um, you did actually answer the questions I'd raised. Fantastic. So that's always a good start. Look, sticking in the Tasman area, mm -hmm. um, Madeline, you probably realise where I'm going with this then, the New Zealand government's had some really interesting policies that they've put in place. And I guess, you know, perhaps you could share with us, you know, your thoughts in terms of what are the key lessons that we've learned from the farmer's experience, remembering that today we're talking about farmer-led adaptation and mitigation. So. What have you learned in terms of from the farmer's experience with those climate change policies in New Zealand and what might that mean for some of the rest of the world? Great. Um, Nahimi Nui i tēnā koto katoa. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be on this panel and for um, coming along this evening. I know it can be a bit hard later on with jet lag, so thanks for coming along and um, it should be really great, I think. So as context, um, Beef and Lamb New Zealand is a levy-funded organization. We are by farmers for farmers. And uh, as a bit of context about the New Zealand red meat industry, um, about 90% of the products that we produce are exported to over 110 different countries worldwide. And when we take that back to a New Zealand context, um, the absolute majority of our uh, red meat production is in a pasture-based system. Right. So um, there's a bit of debate about regenerative agriculture and what that looks like 
in our context, but um, it's a very strongly grass-based system with rotational grazing um, as the majority of the, how we do things. So um, we do that without subsidies from our um, centralized government system, so our farmers are at um, the mercy of the market much of the time. And as part of that, um, they have done a lot of work um, to improve their efficiencies over time, as well as to uh, maintain the uh, natural capital of their farm system. So based on our estimates, about a third of the country's uh, native bush actually sits within sheep and beef farmland. Um, and our farmers really are proud of being stewards of these areas on their farm systems. Um, so in terms of some lessons to be learned based on that context, um, because New Zealand has an emissions profile that's strongly dominated by the land use sectors, um, we have been having these conversations about food, agriculture, climate change um, for quite a long time. So um, I've seen others who have been uh, more involved in this space much longer than myself here. Um, so we started as a government funding research, for example, into some mitigation technologies since 2003. Right, so we've been on this journey for a long time, and our farmers have been putting levy money into that since day dot, right? So um, when it comes to things a bit more recently, um, we've had a really big debate and discussion in the country about what are the expectations that should be placed upon our agricultural sectors because of our greenhouse gas emissions profile, where about 50% of our emissions actually come from the ruminant livestock sector. With that in mind, um, we have put in law in our domestic targets um, some settings where uh, there are separate emissions reductions targets for short-lived greenhouse gas emissions as compared to long-lived greenhouse gas emissions. And this is something that has been recently recommended by the IPCC as a best practice for others to follow. And that's really because of the differential impact that these greenhouse gases have on the climate. And although the uh, predominant conversation that we tend to hear um, in these forums and in others is the need to um, reduce emissions and get to net zero carbon, um, in a context for us, um, methane doesn't necessarily need to get to zero emissions to have the same impact as a net zero carbon dioxide target. So it's slightly technical, but it's a really important key distinction for us and our farmers, and that's something that um, they have learned and adopted quite strongly over the last few years. And although we don't necessarily agree with the domestic reductions that are currently in law, um, we are very proud to have a split gas target um, as a key fundamental part of how we approach these issues. Yeah, that split gas um, model is quite unique, and so uh, mm. I know there's a lot of other mm. countries are looking at whether or not they should follow along in that. Now, look, I'm going to you know, you know, we've, of course, briefed the panel, and they know what the questions are, but I'm not going not to follow that, and I'm not going to follow the order either. Um, no surprise to those who know me. Andy, as the farmer on our panel, and as a New Zealand beef and dairy farmer, um, you know, this panel is called, you know, this entire session is called Farmer-Led Adaptation and Mitigation. As a farmer, Andy, you know, we're talking about farmer-led. Um, are farmers leading? And why should they lead? And perhaps even more importantly, what might prevent them from leading? So tell us about your leadership, Andy. <coughs> well, at risk of being told to be put out to pasture, um, <laughs> I've been in, working in practice change for 42 years and, um, and farming for 34 years. So, um, so I'm always, and I'm very conscious that I'm learning more every day now than I was uh, when I was doing an agricultural science degree in the late 70s. Um, three times today, if I could, without just a couple of sentences before I answer your question, Donald, three times today I've heard from people on panels or whatever that farmers do not, do not like change. Now, that is rubbish. So, in my view, farmers are natural optimists. You don't farm in variable climatic environments biological systems with international exchange rate variations and um, market variations unless you're an optimist. So that's the first thing. Secondly, farmers, in my view, have a, a, an acute risk radar. 
thirdly, they have longer term horizons because you can't take a one year view if you want to fund. Um, and they are rational investors, just like banks. So if a set of information, when you talk about leading, is put to them which they can't rationalise, or they can't assess the risk appropriately, then they'll, they'll back off. So why would we lead? Um, it's probably about six things. One, the economic signals have to be clear and simple. Secondly, it has to save labour because most farmers, in my experience, and I'm certainly one of them, are either time poor or wish when they were 65 they'd spend a bit more time with the family than when they were younger than they did. Um, thirdly, it's got to, you've got to be able to visually see the improvements. And one of the issues with methane or greenhouse gases is you can't see it. So things that are visual, like a centre pivot, for example, centre pivot irrigator or something like that, you can see green grass versus brown grass, can't you? So that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Um, preferably not capital hungry, because that entails a discussion with a bank or an equity financier or something like that. Simple to adopt, easy to rationalise. The collective effort and responsibility is really important because if you can mitigate your risk by doing it jointly, as in a co-op, in a cooperative, in our case Fonterra, Jay's case DFA, um, you know, ALA, Freestand Campina, etc., then you spread the risk because you share the risk. Um, and, uh, and I think a clear target and breaking down of that target is important. So good ideas go like wildfire, bad ideas go nowhere. So that's the first thing. What prevents lending, and I'm not going to go through a list because there's about 10 things, but just a couple, confusing and mixed policy messages, because when you get confusing messages, all human beings do nothing. And, and the second one I'd call out is true economic signals being hidden by other payments. In some areas there's subsidies, in some areas there are other, other payments, but you hide the true economic signal, which means you can kick the can down the road for longer. In terms of are we leading, I think farmers are making natural progress, and I'm not going to go on to all the things like genetics and animal health and feeding, where we're already making progress, but it is there. We have got collective capital in the form of cooperatives and so on. Farmers are also investing because it's foregone dividends in the scope one and two emissions outside the farm gate as well as inside the farm gate, and I think that's an important principle. But are we going fast enough? Clearly not. You know, I think we've got to front up to that and say we are going to have to double our rate of gain in order to meet, you know, like in Fonterra's case, we set 30% by 2030 off a 2018 baseline. That entails essentially doubling the rate of gain. So how might we do it? Probably four things I'd call out to finish is, firstly, double that rate of gain on the stuff we're already doing. Secondly, the novel technology adoption, and the key limiting factor that, to that is that the science, the, the um, modelling of the science, the approval of it through the regulatory and policy environment, and then the adoption um, has all been done in series, not in parallel, so it just takes too many years to get the rate of progress, unlike COVID, where we had a quick crisis and they developed a vaccine in 44 days. Um, so that novel technology sort of comes in the area of effluent methane inhibit inhibitors and methane destructors, and they're quite different. Um, nitrous oxide savers and carbon dioxide savers. The other thing that farmers have a natural ability to do is sequest carbon, so you can plant trees and farm underneath them if you're in, a, if you're in an animal environment. And lastly, that integrating mechanism of enhancing the natural capital on the farm which includes your family capital, because essentially the world, the vast bulk of the world's farmers are self-employed. And that is a key metric to understand, because it's not a corporate environment by and large, so it's enough from me. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. And you make a number of really interesting points. And one of the things we always need to remember about about farming and agriculture and the food system is that you know we are a unique uh, industry because we're both a source of and a sink for emissions from agriculture. 
um, uh, missions you know, where we sink as well as, as produce them. Um, Jay, I'm going to go to you next. And, and ag again, you know, so you're also in the dairy industry, but if I think about the New Zealand dairy system, there's a reasonable degree of homogenous you know, approach to that. The, the systems are very, very similar you know, across the country. Whereas in the United States, you've got, you know, Amish hand milking 10 cows in Pennsylvania, and then you've got, you know, an average of three or 4,000 cow farms with fully automated barns, et cetera, in California. How do you, as, as Dairy Farmers of America, how do you implement processes, policies, procedures that allow you to set targets, set goals, measure, when you've got that degree of variability across your, your own farming base? Are you hearing me? I'll lean in. Um, so I'm probably only answer half of Donald's questions because it's too hard for me. Uh, he also didn't start by mentioning I also have a dairy herd and a beef herd. So I'm a little bit hurt two. by that. Uh, two herds of three each. So I'm, I'm, I'm a small holder as well. <laughs> that, you realize that makes you the average dairy farm in the world, which is three cups. Yeah, I, I feel average today. I want to focus on the first part of, of what's set up here with the farmer-led, and I want to kind of build on what um, Andy had talked about earlier. I think it's really important as we go through these conversations and look for real answers that we make sure that farmers are at the table, that it's farmer-led. And starting with Donald's comments about diversity, indeed inside my cooperative we have hundreds of farmers who milk 20 cows or less, and we have farmers who milk 20,000 cows or more, radically different farming systems, radically different climatic environments, radically different markets they approach. And so us, to get success, we need to bring everybody inside the tent. We need to have everybody focused on looking at a solution. It's very easy to break apart and almost fight amongst yourself as to who is most sustainable within our own farming system, within the U.S. more broadly and globally. Uh, what's best? Pasture raised in New Zealand? Well, wait, you got to haul the stuff a long way. It's local like they have in Europe. Oh, wait, that's small scale, let's do it big in the U.S., which one wins? And we win when we bring the scale of farming all in together. So that's really important for why farmers need to be inside. Um, and if you can layer up what you do, in the case of us, we have targets inside the cooperative, we have targets inside the U.S., and we're fully inside the pathways to dairy net zero that mean we have global targets as well. So work together. The second one is that dairy farming and farming in general is very complex. Now, complex doesn't mean don't bother us, we're perfect, you don't understand it. We understand we have challenges and understand we have areas we have to improve, but it's really hard from outside to look at. And increasingly, as consumers and policymakers and regulators and people in general are far, far removed from food and farming, when they come in with solutions and a farmer is not at the table, the best intention plans can go awry. You want to make sure farmers are at the table so you find solutions that, to Andy's points, can be adapted, will be adapted, and will be um, impactful in what they do. And the last reason you want farmers in is if you look at the history of the world, I would challenge anybody to find a sector, to find a group of people that has been more innovative, more willing to accept technology and change than farmers. If you want to go fast, put the right incentive in front of a farmer and you'll go. They've proven that for thousands of years and they can do it again. So why do you want to be farmer led? It lets you go big. It lets you go very focused and effective and you can go fast. So make sure the farmers are at the table. And then there's a whole set of challenges that Andrea addressed and I'm happy to address them more specifically from a US perspective on how you can do that. In the interest of time, Donald, I'll throw it back to you. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, you answered about two-thirds of the question, Jay, so we might come back to you again. But before I go to my last panelist, please remember that um, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions yourselves, so make sure you've got them lined up, because I know probably about half the people in the room, and if you don't start asking questions, we'll start asking them of you. So um, my last panelist then is Mitch. Mitch is with the uh, Canadian... Cattlemen's Association. And Mitch, I guess, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask is, as I understand it, you haven't actually set net zero targets and net zero goal yourselves in Canada with the, the beef sector. 
and, and I'm always curious, why is that? But, but I know you have got targets and you have other things. So what have you done instead of setting a net zero target and how are you measuring progress within the Canadian Cattlemen's um, Association? Perfect. Can anyone hear, everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, yeah, thanks Donald. Um, no, we, we haven't set a net zero target, but we do have a, a suite of targets set through the Canadian beef industry and the, the Canadian beef advisors. And so um, we know, like everyone's mentioned on the panel, that there's an increased focus on, you know, how our sectors impact the environment. And so there's more and more importance that we measure this and that we work on improvements. And so setting goals is, you know, the first step in doing that. Um, a brief history of, of how we started was in 2021 or 2020, the Canadian Beef Advisors, which is a group of the seven Canadian national beef organizations, they came together, um, they discussed and they set a national beef strategy. And then within that, they set ambitious 10-year goals that go to 2030 for the beef industry. And this is across different areas of um, greenhouse gases and land use. This is biodiversity, um, water, uh, animal health, food loss and waste technology and innovation. And, and what these goals do is they, they not only help us to, you know, make incremental improvements and work on continual improvement, but they showcase the beef industry as integral for climate change mitigation, for biodiversity conservation, and for embracing innovation, and, and showcase, position the beef industry as, a, as the Canadian beef industry as contributing already to a nutrient dense and high quality protein, which we are providing um, across the world as Canada exports, you know, 50% of its beef. Um, you asked, how are we measuring our progress? And so progress is measured through the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, um, the National Beef Sustainability Assessment. It's baselined in 2013 and 14, and progress is reported on that every five years. Uh, and of course, like we mentioned, due to COVID, there was some, some delays in progress reporting on this. However, um, in Early next year, in 2024, we're hoping and eagerly awaiting for the release of uh, the next NBSA, which should, you know, give us an update on the status, a halfway marker of where Canada is at with its with its goals. Um, and so, a quick digression: I'll just say from the from the last assessment, the initial assessment, you know, it said that can Canadian beef um, has a carbon footprint of less than half of the world's um, global emissions and represents only. 2.4% of Canada's national emissions. It also shared that 68% of wildlife, of Canada's wildlife capacity, is found on a third of the agricultural lands, which many of those lands are managed by beef producers in Canada. And it said, it shared that approximately one and a half billion tons of carbon are stored in the 35 million acres of grasslands that are remaining in Canada, and we're seeing you know, rapid declines in those grassland ecosystems already. Um, and so back to goals, I mentioned that they're in, across all areas. Um, we've got goals on food waste, to reduce food waste in the, in the sector by 50%. Um, we've got goals on land use to maintain and protect the, the 35 million acres of grasslands that I mentioned. And we have a emissions intensity goal to reduce primary production greenhouse gas emissions intensity by 33% by 2030. Um, this intensity goal, you know, not only helps us to, you know, continue becoming more efficient and to continue producing, you know, this high quality Canadian beef, and it but it also emphasizes the fact that Canada produces already a relatively low emission beef and sends it out to the world. Um, and so also what we see in this big picture of global emissions is that we we want this to be based on intensity, based on efficiency, because otherwise we may see a shifting of burden, which will, you know, the, the demand for global protein will be, will be filled by a country that, you know, maybe does not have the efficiency of a Canadian or a New Zealand or an Australian or, you know, all these other countries who are doing really amazing, amazing work. And the overall, the global emissions will could be worse off fantastic look thank you to all of the panelists now is an opportunity for you in the audience to 
ask questions. We've got leaders from four major producing uh, countries in the world, from the US, from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand. And so we're going to go to the floor for questions. We've got several hands raised. Do we have mics? Could we start with the gentleman in the front here and then um, coming over here? And was that a hand, Jackie, or were you just moving your glasses? OK. So we've got two or three questions. We'll take the questions all in one go, and then we'll come to the panel, and then we'll see how we're going time-wise. So please, sir. Uh, quick question for New Zealand. I'm curious about you know, the carbon tax that farmers are having for emissions and how you know you think the government thinks the effect will be and how the farmers think what the effect will be of carbon tax on livestock great question so thank you for that um, this gentleman here had a question as well the finger got another mic there uh, anyone else while we're just queuing that up there's a question right behind you the finger so we'll go there as well so and one over here. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Don. Um, Michael Lee from Harper Adams University in the UK. Um, we talk about net zero um, in agricultural productions, but due to national inventories, we, port, we report um, uh, emissions associated with livestock as gross emissions, um, you know, carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product, which of course does not take account for at a farm level, carb carbon removal by the, the farm, Carbon dioxide warming equivalents, i.e. GWP star, doesn't it take account of carbon stocks, or indeed, and critically, the nutritional value of the food that we provide. Um, coming from the UK, I was in a meeting just before I came here, it may surprise you that 55% of the young women in the UK are iron deficient, which is extremely scary. But to do this, to take account of all this and change our reporting basis, we need to move to tier three assessment rapidly. So we need to do assessment on farm. How are we going to pay for this? What's the balance in terms of industry and government to support farmers to do this assessment? And then we need industry to report carbon dioxide warming equivalents per RDI uh, provision. Thanks, Michael. Um and then there's a lady over here as well. We'll go to them. And then we'll take those questions to the panel. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Thomas Hart with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Um, cattle producers in the United States have taken a little bit different approach to our goal setting um, and have set a climate neutrality goal for 2040 based on GWP star. So I would be interested in, in y'all's thoughts on GWP 100 versus other emerging methodologies, um, especially in light of the recent LEAP report that we saw um, a couple months ago. Thank you. And then last question was... Great. Um, um, Emma DeBelco, my university. Uh, I was wondering, this might be a little bit of a broad question, but um, for your work, how has the Global Methane Pledge um, been integrated into your work in making uh, systems? Sorry, the microphone was cutting out a little Sorry, bit. Sorry, yes. Um, how has the Global Methane Pledge uh, specifically uh, been used to integrate um, considerations of methane into your work uh, improving global s livestock sustainability? Fantastic question. So we've got four great questions. Let's go to our panel then. Um, let's start with the carbon tax in New Zealand. Um, Madeline, I might let you answer this one and give Andy a bit of a break on it because there's one of these other questions I'm going to bring up for Andy. So do you want to tackle the, the question of the carbon tax and the position of the government versus the position of farmers on it? Yeah, so um, just as a bit of background, um, the conversation about uh, pricing agricultural emissions has been around again for quite a long time in New Zealand. And uh, what has happened recently um, is, uh, thanks to an introduction by the previous government, um, there was a partnership developed between industry bodies and the government of the day um, to try and develop a uh, farm level emissions pricing system, right? So this was no easy task, uh, to say the least. It was um, numerous years of negotiations within the industry bodies as well as with government. Um, and the partners came together and presented that to the government. Uh, government went back and took a look under the hood and came back and tweaked some things. And as part of those tweaks, um, there was an ability 
for us to support it going forward, really. And that was um, for numerous reasons, but one of the key reasons was um, the impact of this pricing on our effective bottom lines. So depending on the modeling that was presented, um, about a fifth of our farmers would have become unprofitable as part of this taxing system. And because we don't have subsidies in our country, this is a really major impact, um, and the government wasn't willing to provide um, strong support to maintain the viability of those farms. And um, one of the things that we've really learned as part of this is that um, if you are going to be putting forward an emissions pricing scheme or carbon tax, so however you want to call it, um, the purpose of a pricing mechanism is to be encouraging adoption of alternative tools and technologies that would be helping farmers to reduce their impact. And at the moment, those are really far and few, be few uh, between when it comes to a pasture-based system. And although there's plenty um, online and coming, and it would be wonderful to have them as soon as we can, um, right now that's not really a viable option outside of uh, sheep genetics, for example. So um, we're, we're really hoping um, for those to come on board, and its effectiveness um, could be fantastic when we do have those tools and technologies on board and uh, effective incentives for farmers to adopt these in time. Thank you very much. Andy, I don't know whether you want to just give the farmer impression of the very quickly, very briefly. Well, just to be clear for an international audience, um, we don't have a carbon tax. We have a market-based emissions trading scheme. So one of, one of the global complications, of course, is that there are multiple uh, ETSs around the world and they have different pricing um, bases. Fonterra as a, as a shareholder of Fonterra, you know, we paid into the ETS about, I think, $120 million last year as an emitter, and that relates to scope one and two. Um, so that's pretty clear. We're, we're driven really hard, and that's absolute emissions. We want to drive that down by 50% by, uh, by 2030. Um, and, and that entails a lot of capital to do that, probably, you know, one and a half billion to get to, get to see that right through. However, on farm, methane is a longer term um, uh, mitigation measure. So what we've decided in Fonterra is if we go harder on scope one and two emissions, it gives us a little more time to get the 30% number for farmers on farm. Right. And that the mechanism will be the ETS. And I think I'm conscious the new, uh, newly elected climate change minister, uh, Simon Watts, is in the front row. And I think the new government will support that proposal. Welcome, Minister, I should have said, so thank you. Um, Jay, can I go to you, just conscious of time, so we're going to move a little quickly here. Um, there was a question about, uh, from Mike here, about net zero, but, you know, the, the question about national inventories and taking account of carbon stocks, but balancing that nutritional value, etc. Do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, just in brief, I think the headline here is that uh, dairy is, in this case, dairy is unique in that it is both a sink and a source, and when you really think about it more broadly, holistically, um, agriculture in general, but dairy specifically, sustainability is an equation. It is a numerator and a denominator. And the focus continues to be primarily on how do we reduce the denominator? How do we take stuff out of a system where it is killing us? And again, absent looking at that total equation and what do you get for it? What's the numerator you bring? It's not just nutrition, it's economic livelihoods. It's short-term available supply chains of high-quality nutrition in parts of the world otherwise don't have it. It's all kind of things you bring that are not part of the conversation. Um, they need to be part of the conversation. I don't have an answer as to how you make it part of the conversation, um, but it's an important issue for us to always keep in mind. It's a bit that complexity of agriculture versus other things. Thank you, Jay. And if I could just, I'm going to take this next question and maybe um, apply it to both um, meat and Meat and Livestock Australia, and also um, cattlemen. Uh, sorry, and I keep calling you cattlemen. I know you're Canadian Cattle Association. My apologies, Mitch. But there was a question from the, the U.S. National Cattlemen's um, Association, which was talking about goal setting and based on climate neutrality, and they were looking at GWP star versus GWP 100. Mm. And would you both of you like to quickly comment on that? Absolutely. It's actually a conversation we're having um, with our industry councils back home. Uh, so very topical. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, the MLA publishes our annual emissions report in a range of metrics. So we report on GWP 100, which is 
um, how we equate that 64% net emissions reduction. But we're also posting in GWP star terms, direct methane, which is very important for the, the methane pledge, as well as another novel metric radiative forcing. Um, so we, we try and cater to all audiences, but we still have, we've had this discussion, this debate, and we've come back to, you know, we want to let, continue to lead with GWP 100 for a few reasons. Um, the main one being it's so widely recognised um, and we want to be able to tell our story internationally and compare apples with apples. Uh, GWP star is a novel metric that um, picks up changes in short-lived greenhouse gases um, in, a, in a more sensitive way. So for a methane-heavy industry like livestock, um, it can be seen as um, being more... Uh, a, a more accurate depiction of what is happening uh, year to year. The challenge with it is it does have historical dependencies, so uh, it will multiply or have a multiplier effect in the result it gives you based on positive or negative change year to year and really um, will exacerbate what's happening, whether you're going in the right direction or the wrong, wrong direction, whatever that, that may be. So as a um, metric, it's very difficult for comparison with, say, a developed country or a developed industry like Australia, who's sort of produced all of its emissions and now wants to um, restrict those by being more efficient, um, it, will, it will look very favourably upon an industry that's reducing methane year on year. But for a country or an industry that may be smallholder livestock farmers that's wanting to build you know, some economic resilience and grow their herd in a more sophisticated way, they would be heavily penalised by a metric like GWP star. So there are challenges with using that to tell our story. It also doesn't get us away from the fact that we need to reduce methane. Um, and yeah, ultimately would penalise any situation where the herd was increasing. So something to think about. Thank you. Mitch, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think that the only thing that I would add as well, and it kind of goes off to what Julie was saying, is GWP 100 is such a, a kind of widely um, agreed upon metric that, and the, the goals that Canada has set and our, our intensity-based goal and the reason that it's not, you know, net zero. And, and we have chosen that so that we are in more of an alignment with, you know, the s several of the goals that our government has set and that our industry. And so um, that's really all that I, that I would add on that. Great. Now, we're, we're actually a little over time, so I'll just quickly answer the, the methane pledge question and, and from a dairy perspective, and that was, I think, the global dairy sector was the first agricultural commodity to sign up to the Global Methane Pledge. We did so on the basis that they were targeting um, emission intensity for methane. And so Global Dairy Platform and, and its members of dairy companies have signed up to the Global Methane Pledge. I'm not sure whether the beef industry, whether you've made a commitment to the Global Methane Pledge? Australia rather than the beef. So a lot of countries have, and therefore you, you know the, the industries are captured within that. But um, look, at this point, I think we're going to have to wind this panel up because um, I could go all night, and I know you probably don't want that, and you're more interested to hear as well from our next panel. So with that, let me thank our panelists. Um, so starting with Jay, Andy, Madeline, Mitch, Julia. So thank you all very much for your um, contribution tonight, and can we show them our appreciation? <laughs>
I'll introduce you again a little bit more formally. So Bernard Kimura from, from the government of Kenya, working on uh, livestock uh, sustainability and, and climate in Kenya. Anna Sonnegaard, who's the executive vice president of marketing, sustainability, and a few other things with Arla Foods. Uh, Fernando Sampaio, uh, Brazilian Beef Exporters Association. Uh, but with uh, wide-ranging experience in the beef industry and before that was working with PCI in, in Brazil on sustainable approaches uh, in that country. Bob Lowe, as I mentioned, he has several hats, uh, is a cattle producer, uh, is on the board of my organization, GRSB, and in the Canadian Cattle Association. And Charles Paitua right at the end there, who is uh, a representative of Maori landowners in Beef and Lamb New Zealand, uh, and representing that uh, sort of indigenous populations, land holdings in New Zealand, which is quite a, a different, or probably brings a slightly different perspective to the, uh, what happens on farm in New Zealand for, for various reasons that we'll go into. So uh, maybe just to go straight to you, Charles, um, Maori farmers are in a particular s situation with re regard to your land holdings, it's not as easy for you to trade land as it would be for any other farmer. And so you're probably not uh, looking at short-term gains like selling out to maybe uh, pine tree plantations. But can you tell us a little bit about how you look at climate change and how you, uh, you know, see your commitments to uh, a healthy landscape? Okay. <coughs> Uh, as is protocol at home, um, I like to always say thank you for being here and saying thank you to the home people of, uh, of the UAE for uh, hosting us. Um, yeah, so to, to answer your question, um, there are a few, quite a few differences for us as Māori landowners. Um, when, if I could probably take a little bit of a history lesson, um, between 1320 and 1350, our ancestors arrived in New Zealand as the first... Um, human inhabitants of New Zealand. Uh, we came from the South Pacific, so areas through, mainly through uh, Rarotonga, Tahiti, Vanuatu. We came from there down through to, uh, to where we reside today. Um, it took another 400 years before the um, uh, colonials sort of came to New Zealand, firstly with by Abel Tasman, um, who was the first European to discover New Zealand, and a whole bunch of other people waving at him from on the beach. <laughs> And, um, and then in sort of roughly 17, nearly 1770, the, um, James Cook arrived. Um, from that point, um, our land was all communally owned. So uh, we owned it as families. Uh, we, we call ourselves um, hapu or iwi, uh, which is, uh, iwi is a, an accumulation of families. So um, at that time, uh, we um, engaged with the, uh, with, with, uh, with Captain Cook, and then other colonials came along, and we um, we sparked up a really good relationship. Um, through most of the early part, or the late part of the 1700s, early part of the 1800s, um, our people were actually trading um, all sorts of stuff with Australia, and uh, we owned our own ships, so we were we were a pretty uh, industrious bunch. Um, there was a bit of rough times happened through the late, or so the early part of the 1800s, where we decided. Uh, with the Crown, we signed a treaty, uh, and that was on the 6th of February, 1840. Uh, in that treaty, uh, we had a um, we had a, an understanding um, that we would work together. The, the Crown, at the time, they would look after their inhabitants, as in um, some of the rowdy um, whalers and um, and whatnot that were currently uh, causing trouble on the island, and um, Māori would look after our own, who were also causing, there were some causing troubles as well. So um, fast forward uh, about another 20 something years, 23 years, and the Crown at that time wanted land for settlers, um, and the Crown took that by force. Um, so between 1862 and 1880, we went from owning 20 million hectares, or collectively communally owning 20 million hectares, um, to roughly half, and then by the 1980s, we were left with about 1.5 million hectares of land. So, um, fast forward to today, uh, that 1.5 million hectares, roughly 50% of it, well, sorry, a little bit less than that, 48% is in a tree of some kind, whether it's indigenous biodiversity or a um, production forestry, and the rest is in uh, pastoral. So, 
Um, one of the, the laws, um, Māori land sits under a separate law to other uh, land titles within New Zealand. Um, that, that law means that uh, it, it, it looks after us in some ways and then it hinders us in other ways. So the bit it looks after us is we can't sell that land, so we will have that in perpetuity and forever. So, um, which is a really good thing. It means we we don't we won't jump um, we don't jump ship very quickly. But the other part is it's very very hard to attract capital. So um, we can't get bank funding. We can't get loans because you can't use your land as collateral. So um, it's very very tough to. So um, one of the things regarding uh, that land tenure is we have to look at things in sort of generational cycles. We can't look at it in uh, a financial year. So it means um, things like this, like climate change. Um, it's a big problem. It has been a big problem for a long, long time. And we're having to take a really intergenerational view of what we do uh, on the land. That doesn't mean, um, and it means we can't run away from the land as well. So uh, that's probably, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, Charles. It, it's definitely interesting. I was wondering if I might switch over to Fernando. A uh, lot of history in, in the way the uh, Brazilian Amazon was colonized and so on, which, which probably also informs uh, what you're doing there. And I was, you know, there's been a lot of talk, of course, about, um, you know, the frontier and expansion of industry. But there's also another story to be told about intensification of the beef industry in Brazil uh, and improving productivity, uh, improving yields, um, and basically a lessening of the footprint per kilo, so a lessening of the intensity. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that's been achieved in Brazil and how you see it going in the future? Yeah, well, thank you, Harry, for the invitation to be here today. Yes, well, uh, we look at the challenges that we have today in Brazil, and to understand that, we have to look in two different ways. One is about land use change or deforestation, and the other one is about land use efficiency. And when we talk about land use change, you mentioned this historical process of territorial occupation that happened in Brazil, something that happened in North America maybe 100 years ago. It happened in Brazil in the last 50 years. So the cattle was really used to occupy the land, and that's a process that is still happening in some frontiers in the Amazon region. But Brazil is a young country, and we are trying to change course and we still have a lot of our environmental assets conserved. To do that, uh, we need efforts from the public sector and from the private sector. So on the public sector, a large part of the Brazilian NDC is based on reduction of deforestation, and the government has a plan to really tackle illegality and land grabbing in the Amazon. And this is happening, and this is giving positive results. On the private side, our industry is monitoring every animal that we are sourcing in the Amazon region to make sure that this is not coming from illegal deforestation for indigenous territories or protected public land. And we are trying to improve our traceability systems. And this is important because it's not that Brazil doesn't have a traceability, but our traceability systems were built for animal health control and for the safety purpose. And what we are being asked today is how we can add environmental guarantees on top of the food safety guarantees that the traceability was built for. So we are right now in this dialogue with our government on how we can improve the existing systems to add this environmental guarantee. And actually our round table in Brazil just made a proposal for the Brazilian government on how we can do that. So this is looking to deforestation and land use change. So our industry is making its part, uh, trying to control the sourcing, improving traceability, and at the same time the government has uh, decided to tackle illegality in the region. But looking to land use efficiency, uh, you know, we have been improving our productivity a lot on the last 20 years, and uh, Brazil has become a big player on the international market, and we see the market as a big engine to push for efficiency. So the fact that Brazil is improving is because we are inserted in a global market, and that's pushing the supply chain to become more efficient. But the fact is that we still have a huge gap on the livestock production 
uh, uh, between the best producer and the worst producer, there's a large space for improvement. And the basis of the pyramid, we still have a lot of small and medium holders of cattle that are on low levels of technology. And we can see that as a big problem or as a big opportunity because, in fact, uh, we have like 140 million hectares of pastures in Brazil and like 70% of that is on a low level of technology. And we have space for our agriculture to grow over this pasture area and we have space for our beef production to grow without the need of new areas. So we can produce a lot more beef using a lot less land and reducing the impact because when we talk intensification, uh, uh, a lot of people think of this like big feedlots that <laughs> you have a lot of input and and that's not, uh, you know, the, the, our production will be always pasture based just because it's more profitable that way, you know. So we are talking basically about improvement of pasture, the renovation of pastures that were uh, implemented uh, years ago. Our government just announced here at the COP a new program uh, uh, to, you know, improve the, the, the pasture lands in Brazil and to work with integration with agriculture. So we do have a lot of opportunity of increasing production and at the same time reducing the impact and the emissions caused by livestock. Just working with the pasture and with this uh, low carbon agriculture techniques that we developed in Brazil. Great. Thanks, Fernando. And I, I don't want to seem like I'm skipping you, uh, but I'm going to move straight on to Bernard and then come back to you, Hannah. Uh, because I think there's, there's an, another sort of parallel there to, to hear from Bernard. Um, you know, Kenya is also a country with a growing population, with a growing demand, and, and probably one of the countries uh, represented here that's, that's also severely being impacted by climate change. So uh, how are you coping with those combined challenges? You've got increased demand, you've probably got increased population pressure on the land, uh, and you've got a very varied livestock industry. You've got pastoralists, you've got milk producers, you know, you, you've got the whole gamut going on in, in one country, and, and it's not one of the wealthiest countries. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're dealing with all of these challenges? Yeah. Um, can I be had? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, and uh, especially appreciate being in this panel. And uh, there's a lot of learning that I've had uh, from the first panel, and I'm also hearing the same. Um, what I want to say is, um, you're right in what you're saying, uh, in the fact that if you look at Kenya, for example, we are looking at a country that is 80% arid and semi-arid. Um, only about 60%. Is, is, is high potential, what we can call high potential. And uh, most of the land um, in the, I mean, most of the area in the Asal area is mainly livestock. And in all the high potential area, it's mixed crop livestock farming, right? So when you talk about issues around uh, climate change and the uh, impact of climate change, uh, we are severely affected. Uh, to bring this into context, in the last uh, uh, six uh, seasons, we lost 2.5 million um, animal uh, units uh, due to droughts. Yeah? And uh, uh, for the people who reside in the Asal areas, that reflected a loss in terms of uh, livelihoods, in terms of uh, their nutrition, and we are still on a recovery phase. The, 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 the paradox is when the rains came again, they lost animals due to flooding. So it's, it's really a very tense uh, situation. So what, what, what we have done as, as a nation, uh, because of this, uh, the fact that one, uh, Kenya is really, if I can, I can put it, is, is a livestock country. Uh, so what we have done and realizing the fact that uh, our emissions from the agricultural sector 90% are actually from livestock uh, uh, production or livestock-based activities. And these are likely to increase to, I mean, look at agricultural emissions nationally over 30%, uh, and we project that by 2030, this is likely to increase to almost 45, uh, 50%, which is quite high. So what you have done is 
um, if you look at the policies that we have in terms of the uh, national policies on climate, we have made sure that we have integrated issues on livestock in all those policies. So, uh, because we, we, re we realize that, uh, yeah, there are risks in terms of impacts uh, to livestock, but as well, the emission levels are likely to increase. So we need to have um, all uh, livestock uh, policies that we have mainstreaming issues around uh, livestock. Um, in, in our national, nationally determined uh, contribution, uh, one of the things that we, we, we have done is that we have raised ambition to 32% of uh, uh, business as usual by 2030, and livestock is very crucial in this. So it's, it's very important. So in terms of policies, I think that is what you have done so far. Um, to be able to address some of the issues that I've had here in terms of uh, looking at the emissions and how you can be able to track these emissions, uh, we were lucky that we started with the dairy with Tire 2, and we have, we, we, since 2016, we've been able to do inventories using Tire 2. A lot of support from the New Zealand government, and I'm happy and I want to really appreciate uh, the support we have received, and we continue receiving, because uh, without the New Zealand government and uh, technical support from FAO and um, also CCSC, we will not have transitioned. Uh, through the same support, we are widening uh, the emissions tracking using Tire 2 to non-dairy ruminants, and I can report by the end of this year we should be able to report on uh, uh, Tire 2 uh, for all the ruminants in Kenya, which will then give us a room to be able to see, in terms of policy levers, what are the main issues. And for us, it is feeds. Yeah, it's feeds, specifically across the country. But if you look at the arid and semi-arid areas, there is also potential in terms of the breeds that we also are looking at addressing, because there's potential there. Um, uh, so uh, our capacity of the staff has been uh, supported, and uh, we feel that uh, we are getting ready in terms of moving uh, towards uh, more realistic estimates of the emissions, and therefore setting more uh, realistic targets in our, in our policies. Um, in, in dairy specifically, um, I want to talk about a new initiative, and this is coming through the Global Dairy, uh, uh, Global Methane Pledge, okay. yeah, through GDP, yeah. So, um, since 2016, we had what we are calling the Dairy NAMA, Dairy Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions, as a concept note that we submitted to GCF, but it was not uh, going through uh, the channel. But we are happy through uh, uh, the GMP. We have now uh, finalized the design of a new initiative, not just for Kenya, because we realize the dairy industry is not just uh, in Kenya alone. The East African region is linked. So we, we, we will have a regional initiative covering four countries, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda, that is going to address the issues around the emissions. Now, for Kenya alone, and for our ambition in the, in, the, in the NDC. Dairy will actually be able to cover 20% um, of the national ambitions if we implement this uh, project, yeah? Because it's looking at uh, basically three aspects. One is on uh, productivity, enhancing productivity. The gap in efficiency is still uh, not been uh, uh, reached. So there is still gap for us to be able to increase our productivity. We are also looking at reducing emissions uh, through energy efficiency and also uh, bio, um, uh, methane capture using biotechnologies like biodigesters. So for Kenya, I think those are the things that you're looking at across board. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Brennan. And uh, you know, I, I know you could have told us more, but we, we've got limited time and we've got a couple more panelists to go. So Hannah, in, in terms of your work on this, I know that you are also part of the uh, pathways to Dairy Net Zero, so a related project, I guess, to what Bernard was talking about. And uh, Arla is one of the top uh, 10 dairy companies, I guess, in the world, and you're part of this initiative. W what does that mean for Arla? And, and uh, you know, we had a question earlier on about methane. Is there a specific uh, methane element that you're working on within that uh, pathway to Dairy Net Zero? Mm. Yeah, so let me, uh, because uh, maybe 
just to, to start with saying what, what is Pathways to Dairy Net Zero for everyone in the room that doesn't uh, or is not familiar. It's an initiative that we created in the dairy industry um, to really work with what, what pathways do we need uh, globally uh, to take the, uh, the, the dairy sector to uh, zero emissions. Um, and we are learning a lot through the work, um, both in developing countries and also in more mature uh, dairy countries. Um, we, uh, so I come from Arla Foods, so one, uh, another dairy cooperative owned by 8,500 farmers, so very similar to uh, Fonterra, uh, who was here earlier. Um, and um, in the more developed part of, um, of uh, markets, uh, we are uh, working on, uh, within pathways, we are working on uh, how do we account for things up and down the value chain. So, um, you know, we work a lot with what is called scope three within science-based targets. You know, what, how does the reductions that we do on farm uh, get valorized up through the chain towards the customers. And I think that's key uh, if we are going to continue those reductions that we're working on now. So that's, that's a focus. Um, what's also a focus is how can we accelerate uh, some of these areas by working together? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there are a number of examples on that, on those uh, region, more regionally uh, uh, that are very strong. I think specifically for us uh, in Arla, uh, we have spent the last uh, three years um, uh, creating uh, uh, what we call a wheel. Uh, and let, let me just talk a little bit about what's in the wheel. Uh, so um, we started 10 years ago, like many other dairy co-ops, working on how do we measure emissions at farm level. Um, and uh, we uh, rolled that out in 2020, which means that we now are um, covering all our farms uh, on uh, what we call climate checks. So there's a climate check on each farm that measures uh, the CO2. The, why is that important? I think that's important because we actually know then what drives the difference between the best performing and the lowest performing. Um, and 75% of that difference is explained by five big KPIs, and one of them is indeed feed efficiency. Um, uh, so I think working with those KPIs is key uh, globally. Um, so that's the first part of the wheel. The second part of the wheel is, of course, to set targets and, and create a roadmap for how we get uh, to... Uh, uh, and in our case, uh, we have a 30% reduction target on scope three. Uh, we have a 63% reduction target on scope one and two. Um, whenever I talk about this, I say, that's really easy. We just need to get it done. It's just an investment. And uh, you know the technologies are there. It's energy efficiency. It's conversion to renewable energy. And I think we just need to, uh, to get those investments done. What's complex is... Uh, what needs to happen on farm. Now, to the conversation earlier, I actually do believe that not just in Arla, but in co-ops across the world, the farmers are leading. Uh, and the reason why I believe that is my third part in the wheel. So the third part in the wheel is we have to create an incentive. We have to build an incentive for farmers to uh, really move. I think what we learned was two things. The, the person that a farmer trusts the most is another farmer. So we have to build the community. The second thing is, if we don't combine climate and profit for farmers at farm level, we are just happy activists. Uh, you know, we are, just, we are just irrelevant people for farmers that go around talking about things that are not relevant. Yeah. So that's the third part of the wheel. And then I think the fourth part of the wheel for us is commercialization. Um, and uh, we have uh, announced uh, a few weeks ago that we now have 10% of our milk pool signed up uh, with customers, where there's money flowing from customers back through the value chain back out to farmers. Uh, our plan is that by the end of 24, that goes up to 20%. And I think if we don't get that last bit in as well, 
we're not going to be able to continue to spin this wheel and get the reductions we need because the money won't be there. Great. Thank you. And, and what you said just then, I was uh, in a discussion two weeks ago in, in London in a room full of people who were talking about farmers with no farmers. And, and it really uh, kind of riled me, to be honest, to hear people yeah. deciding what they were going to do for and with farmers without having any farmers in the room. Mm. Mm. So, Bob, you're a farmer. Mm. Uh, and you're at the pointy end. You're also in a really cold place. But uh, <laughs> what is it that uh, you are doing and you see your uh, colleagues in, in the industry doing uh, to, to move the needle on beef production in Canada? Well, I think, and I'm going to be fairly high level here because every farm is different. Mm. I think what Hannah said, that you need to include profitability along with, with mm. sustainability. They have to be in the same sentence, or it's, it's not going to happen. And a dozen years ago or so, or so ago in Canada, when the, the world was starting to think about this global population boom and how are we going to feed them, and at the same time, the UN came out with a, some kind of a prediction that said that Canada would be one of the six countries in the world that would have the ability to export food, the, the land mass and the technology to export food without using it up all up themselves. So it was realized by industry that we needed to produce more and we also, because of activists, we realized we had to do it with a whole lot less, which means we needed to use the science. We need to develop the science, we had to adopt the science that was there as an industry. And we needed to keep abreast of this and we formed, Mitch made comment to it, the Canadian Round Table for Sustainable Beef. They had three core areas to work on. First was benchmarking. You can't improve if you don't know where you're starting. Verification. And then at the point we're on now is developing sustainability projects, what works and what doesn't. And I'd like to say the, the benchmarking, Mitch touched on that, the verification has been the hard part. To get non-producer, producers wanting to go into verification programs is, is a tough call. It's extra work, it's extra paperwork, mm. and a whole bunch of them at the end don't have any extra money. So we actually developed a system through a couple of major corporations where you actually got paid to be what we call VBP plus verified. And if your calf went through the whole process from the farmer to the, process, the feeder to the processor and all the stages were verified, you actually did get paid. It, it came back and there's been glitches and we're having problems with it. We aren't. At that, we are still aren't getting the, the uptake that we would like. Mm. And a lot of the reason is, is because of, I guess in Canada, the system of selling cattle is basically by auction. So you might be, as a producer, verified. But if, some, if a feeder buys your calves and he's not verified, you don't get any incentive. Mm. Right now, we're working on how can you incentivize each person in the in the value chain without having to incentivize all of them, which is yeah, that's a tough a tough thing to handle. Um, I don't know if I really have a whole lot more to say than that. I mean, well, different producers do different things, and I know we're running out of time. Yeah, we are running out of time, so that's it's it's good. Thanks, Bob. Uh, uh, we'll take a question or two at most from the floor and see if we can get a good answer from the right panelists for you. Anyone? Yep. From uh, Chico. Hi, thank you. Uh, it was a great panel and great to hear you all. Um, Francisco Beduski from National Wildlife Federation. Uh, our studies shows that uh, the nature-based solutions can contribute a lot, not only for the end disease, but also uh, for some issues that you guys raised, like uh, improving productivity and uh, profitability in the cattle production. Uh, so my question is, if they are so good, 
why we see just a little of these, solu these kind of solutions on the field, what do we um, miss from a farmer perspective, what do we miss to have more implementation of this kind of solution on the field? Thank sure. you. Right, thanks, Chico. So why are people not taking them up? If they're, if they're going to deliver you profits in the long term, why are people not adopting nature-based solutions all over the place? What's, what's the obstacle there? Who wants to take a shot at that? Fernando? I think for me it's just a mix of you know, technical assistance and investments. We need investments models that are adequate for the livestock producer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not only about the money. They really need technical assistance, at least in the public that we know in Brazil. They need guidance on how to use and implement those technologies in the right way. But yes, they can be more profitable, they can reduce their impact, but mm -hmm. that's convincing, but they need the support to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need some money up front to, to even try it, and you need to know that it's triable in the first place. Yeah, yeah I, I don't actually think it's just about money. I, oh. it, it definitely is about money, but I think it's also about us building the, the sort of ecosystem around the farmer so that when you go to your consultant and your advisor of A, B, and C, that people are equipped to give that advice uh, on these solutions. I think it's also about that. Yeah. I'd love to take another question from this gentleman here. And there was another one. We'll see if we've got time. Maybe I might be slightly Sorry. complicating the matter. Um, my parent is from South Africa, from SAI, a family farmer organization. And I think in South Africa there's a bit of a uniqueness, and that is that we are ranching with wild animals. So um, I'm, I'm just curious. So, of course, wild animals also eat grass and so on. And in South Africa we've got a vast amount of wild animals and beautiful biodiversity exactly because we do have people farming with wild animals. And I'm just curious if anybody is considering the impact, if this is happening now on tame animals, what would be the impact on wildlife ranching? Thanks, and could you take your question as well, just sure. so that we hear it? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nika. I'm part of the Canadian Climate Action Network, and I have a nonprofit called Sustainable Food Transition Institute. And I'm just asking this as a member of the general public that's not in this industry. I feel like you guys all talk to each other a lot, but my question is, like, how are you communicating the fact that you're taking these increased measures um, to the general public? And like, what's the accountability measures? Like, are you going to have reports every year? Or, or kind of what are you doing to really hold the industries you represent accountable to actually meeting these targets you're setting? Thank you. Does anybody have a quick answer? Bernard? Yeah, um, the one of South very Africa quick. is very interesting. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, in Kenya we are actually um, uh, doing conservancies where we have both livestock and, uh, and, and, and uh, wild animals. And uh, there, is, there is evidence that there is benefit to the communities that, that are actually practicing that. It's, it's, it's been there traditionally. But now it is being reinforced because of uh, improving the grazing plans and making sure that we are optimizing the number of livestock within the, uh, the grazing areas. Thanks, Bernard. Hannah? If I should just give a short version to your uh, uh, question, I think um, if you go on, I think probably any company, Fonterra, Friesland, Alda, I don't know the meat companies well enough, uh, go and look at our annual reports. It, they're more transparent than anything else you'll find. And you, you get all the reporting on all the KPIs in there. So uh, you can look into our engine room more than you know, probably. <laughs> yeah. Could I just add a point to that, sure. uh, to your question as well? Is, um, locally for us in New Zealand, we have a lot of our, uh, we call them catchment groups. So they're groups of farmers, schools, a whole bunch of people. Um, and what they do is they have, uh, we have metrics that we've sort of defined by ourselves as a community. So we, we decide what water is, um, what we'd like our water at. So it's a holistic view, so we don't just look at greenhouse gases. So one of the bits we do do is we decide as a community what those levels are, because we're the ones who live there and have to deal with it. And then the farmers and landowners around us, we work together to try and bring all those levels down. So one of the key catchments over home is Rotorua, um, which is a lake. Um, we had to reduce the um, nitrates into that lake by 30, uh, 50%, and we've done that through a number of different mechanisms. We have to report on that every five years. 
to not just uh, each farmer, but the catchment has to report uh, wider as well. Thanks, Charles. So I'm sorry I'm going to give you a like, 30-second closing to this because we've run out of time, but it, it's been really interesting. And I think what you've gathered from it is there is a huge amount of activity out there amongst farmers and the people who are buying from them. There is a, a, a willingness to support uh, change and a move in the right direction, and there's very much a willingness from farmers to actually make that change. It's in their own interests to be able to adapt to climate change, obviously.